Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. I'm Cristian Benavides, and welcome to our first edition of Cafecito from Home, our digital edition. I have my cafecito right here. I'm ready, you know, to get the show uh, started. We had a couple of months of a hiatus, but we are back. Today, we have a very special show. I'm going to introduce our guest. We have Francisco Moya, who is a council member for District 21. We have Dr. Michelle Azu. She's a physician and surgeon at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center. And we have Yatsiri Tovar with the organization Make the Road. Thank you guys, both of you, uh, all three of you for being here with me today. Um, all right, so we're gonna first begin with something that broke yesterday in the afternoon, just as we were uh, talking about what we would talk about today on today's show. Um, this is a big announcement by the Trump administration, which is uh, basically has signed a memo. In this memo, uh, they're basically saying that they're not going to count undocumented immigrants in the census. Now, it, it's a little complicated because if you'll recall, and we talked about this late last year, um, the Trump administration had tried to add a citizenship question to the census, and they were unsuccessful in that effort. So there was a big question of how are they going to count undocumented immigrants? What does this memo even mean? I'm going to bring in Council Member uh, Francisco uh, Moya. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, Francisco, talk to me about what this means. What does this memo actually mean to uh, the community, to your constituents? And again, thank you for being here today. Christian, thank you for, for having me. And I'm so happy to be here with, with uh, my guests uh, that are on this panel uh, who are doing tremendous work uh, in their own fields. And uh, you know, this is a great way for us to really uh, talk and highlight the issues that are happening and impacting a lot of folks in our community. Uh, I don't drink coffee. I have a little uh, yerba buena in my uh, little coffee mug. So, you know, I'll be joining you as well. Uh, but, you know, look. Tea is okay, too. Tea is, tea is also okay. all right. Tea is okay. <laughs> uh, look, this is purely political, right? I mean, we know the rhetoric that has come out of the White House consistently. His anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric is nothing new to us, right? And I think that uh, this is unconstitutional. It's going to get shot down in the courts. Uh, even uh, Republicans from his own party uh, know that this doesn't uh, hold any weight. Uh, we are right now uh, in an area, the area that I represent, uh, which was ground zero, the epicenter for COVID, uh, but it's also a high immigrant community. Uh, we have been struggling, traditionally been struggling, to get people to fill out the census form. Um, because of the fear now more than ever uh, coming from the White House, uh, the federal government that is using intimidation tactics uh, that want uh, to make sure that we have an undercount here. You know, we have great organizations uh, like Make the Road New York that we partner up with, but the census, I have been going out to every food pantry in the district. I sponsor six of them uh, throughout. And each uh, week I have uh, tables from the census uh, at, these events where we know we are going to be uh, talking to the people from the community uh, that would be most impacted by this. Uh, what this would mean to us is we would lose a congressional seat. Uh, we would lose federal funding that would come in here for programs uh, such as SNAP uh, and other uh, vital uh, programs that really uh, have an impact on our communities. I believe that this will get struck down in the court. He's losing, he is losing this election. Uh, and he knows it, he has to pivot. And the only way he can do that is by uh, getting his base to come out. And that's because of the anti-immigrant rhetoric that we've seen uh, throughout this presidency. So before we move on to our next topic, I think it's really important to highlight what the census does. And you just touched on that. It gives us the number of people that are living in a certain area so that we can allocate federal funds and we can understand how many congressional representatives can represent that area. Uh, I was talking to a legal expert yesterday who told me that they believe that New York could lose up to two congressional seats because of what's happening. So you guys are doing outreach to members of the community. Do you think that this is a scare tactic overall, uh, Francisco? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, uh, he knows where this is going to, to hurt, right? It's going to hurt in states like New York, um, Florida, California, 
areas that uh, are traditionally blue states but have large immigrant communities. Uh, he's trying to do this to suppress the vote. Uh, we've seen his uh, what he's done in other uh, places throughout the country uh, to suppress early voting. Uh, he knows that, that this is the only thing that he can do is this kind of tactic. It just won't work. It's going to fail, uh, just like everything else that he's tried to do when uh, he tried to, uh, uh, you know, stop DACA from happening. And, and we've seen all of the things that, that this president is trying to do. His poll numbers are showing exactly why he is continuing to ramp this up. But we have a responsibility, right, uh, as elected officials here uh, to do everything we can to make sure that every single person is counted, regardless of your immigration status. That is what the census is all about. The census is here to count every single person that is in this country. We have to make sure that our community, the immigrant community, the undocumented community feels comfortable, one, if we have to, answering the door to a census uh, representative that may go and knock on the door. Two, if organizations such as Make the Road New York and other uh, community-based organizations that are actually out on the ground, that have the credibility with the undocumented community where they feel comfortable, or even like our office where people feel like that they can come and talk to us, we need to be getting that message out on how to do that, right? And uh, in multiple languages, because uh, Queens is, uh, you know, the United Nations, right? Just in, in, in uh, three neighborhoods alone, there's over 160 something languages spoken. Um, and we know that we can bring the, the translations uh, to the communities so that they are filling out the form. It takes less than 10 minutes and it's gonna really be able to decide the next 10 years uh, for where we will be uh, as a state. All right, thank you so much, Francisco. And uh, just as we move on to our next topic, just want to mention that the president has argued that the constitution allows the executive branch to ultimately decide how many people should be counted. But again, this certainly will be challenged in court. The ACLU and the New York State Attorney General have already said that they are uh, filing a lawsuit to stop what, whatever this ends up meaning for uh, the counting of people in the census. And we're gonna move on to our next topic, which I think is almost interconnected because of the amount of funding that we've lost, the amount of tax revenue that New York depends on. And um, this has to do with the impact that COVID has had in uh, New York City. Uh, we're gonna focus on the impact that it's had on Latino communities. For that, I'm going to bring on Dr. Michelle Azu. She's a physician and surgeon at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Azu, for being here with me today. And uh, just, you know, what is it that has made the communities of color so vulnerable to this virus? Uh, Dr. Azu. Thanks for having me. You know, first, I just want to comment that having a group of individuals so committed to taking care of vulnerable groups is so important. So it's nice to see such a varied representation of, of committed people today on this panel. So thanks for being here, everybody. You know, black and brown communities, black and Latino communities typically have always been higher risk for the most vulnerable diseases, heart disease, diabetes. You know, in COVID-19 is one of those diseases, a viral illness um, that impacts those who have high risk conditions. And so we see that, you know, so unfortunately, there are a lot of variables. Social inequities contribute to a large portion, some of the disease concerns we have in various communities, especially Black and Latino. Yeah, I mean, uh, according to city data, uh, the COVID-19 rate is almost four times higher among Latino communities than general population. So I wonder, you, you touched on some of those comorbidities that we may have in uh, Latino communities. What is it you think that can also affect this? Because we, we see a lot of uh, community members that are still going out to work. They don't have the luxury to have Zoom at, you know, at home, or they don't have jobs where you can do that through Zoom. So I wonder how that also can impact uh, members of the community. Yeah, it's a huge impact. You know, essential work is critical. It's the backbone of our country. But most essential workers, if you're looking at your race-based differences, you're going to find a higher likelihood of essential workers being from vulnerable communities. So there's less of a choice in showing up the next day. 
And that's a problem, you know? So if you don't work, you don't get paid for a lot of individuals. And so you're going to be committed to your family. And that means showing up and at times putting yourself in a higher risk situation. You know, the other thing I'd like to say is that so many of our beautiful communities enjoy spending time with each other. And so it's possible also that just the family nature of, of so many of us can contribute to more groups being together and potentially, you know, not social distancing quite as much, but it's something we have to keep in consideration. You know, summer's here and we all like to enjoy spending time with each other, but this, this illness is far from over. You know, that's, that's the trouble and it's highly contagious and we need to keep being careful and mindful about what these very concerning statistics are. Yeah, and the, the statistics are really concerning. Uh, 61% of the US population is white, 53% of COVID deaths are people of color, so either black or Latino. I really appreciate that, Dr. Asu. Uh, speaking about you know the impact that COVID has had, I'm gonna move on to Yatsiri Tovar uh, from Make the Road New York. Make the Road, of course, is an advocacy organization that has fought for immigrant rights in um, not just in Queens, that's where their headquarters are, but all throughout uh, the tri-state and even farther out from that. Uh, Yatsiri, you guys uh, were hit hard by COVID. Talk to me about that. Thank you for being here. Um, thank you for having me, Christian. Um, yes, um, unfortunately, our organization, Make the Road New York, lost over 60 of our members. Um, and um, it was, you know, probably the most difficult time um, that we have had um, dealing, um, you know, as Dr. Zhu um, mentioned, as you mentioned before, you know, immigrant, uh, ethnic, Black people, Black, black communities long before the pandemic were marked by inequality, inequality right? Um, so they had limited access to health care, um, to health insurance, um, typically have low incomes, uh, live in overcrowded conditions. And then on top of that, you add uh, that a group of workers, you know, frontline workers going out, risking their lives of getting um, COVID, and also having uh, other people completely lose their jobs. So all of this, in a sense, was kind of like a recipe for disaster. And unfortunately, it was uh, our communities that were hit the hardest. Yeah, I think if you look at the communities of Jackson Heights, Corona, and East Elmhurst, they are in the list of the top 10 communities that are most hit hard by the virus here in New York City. I have a question uh, for you, um, uh, Francisco. If we can talk about this, you know, according to the Pew Research Center, from April 2020, U.S. Latinos are among the hardest hit by pay cuts and job losses due to coronavirus. Around half, 49% of Hispanics, say they or someone in their household has taken a pay cut or lost a job or both because of COVID-19. So I wonder what advice you have for local small business owners in your district, also for those who have lost their jobs. Right. Well, look, uh, that's a great question. And I, I just want to uh, add a couple of things here. You know, the, the doctor uh, really pointed out something uh, that is so important that we, we, we don't lose sight of, right? And that is that uh, we can't telecommute from home. The, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, only 16% of Latinos uh, in the uh, city of New York were able to telecommute from home. They're essential workers. They were the individuals that were delivering our food, that were manning the registers and stocking the aisles in the supermarkets throughout this whole process. But we also have to talk about the other conditions that factor into this. And the, the doctor was talking a little bit about this, but it's we live and, and, and the folks from Make the Road New York know how we've been uh, dealing with this is the density issue in our community. So we have multi-generational homes, right? Uh, where large families live together. Right, you live with the grandmother, your aunt, your cousins, all in one house. Uh, the essential workers have to go out. They come back in. One of them is sick. They then pass it along to the rest of the family, and then that's where we started seeing kind of the big spike, right? Where uh, individuals who were because of the lack of housing uh, were getting the rest of the family sick. We live in a community where we don't have the luxury. It, it demonstrated the socioeconomic gap in the city of New York. We don't have the second homes. 
We, we, our people don't have the ability to go to the Hamptons or upstate New York and ride this uh, pandemic out. We had to stay here and fight and we had to stay here and make sure that we were going to survive whichever way possible. And part of that is that we need to really talk about the lack of access to healthcare. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that, you know, we are, in, uh, the majority of Latinos uh, are in the hospitality industry, which was the one that got devastated the most from whether uh, delivering food or working in the service industry in the hotels. You know, small business owners in Corona, East Elmhurst, Jackson Heights, they're immigrant store owners, right? They, they have no support that really is coming from the federal government, right? We need our federal allies, uh, our members of Congress and, and, and senators to make sure that uh, when we're talking about the PPPs, that it's coming directly to those communities that have been most affected by this, right? We need to, when our, when our zip codes are reporting the highest number of deaths in the city of New York, highest number of unemployment in the city of New York, that means that we need all the services that we can get here. One, to sustain uh, the uh, economy here because we gotta support the local businesses. They employ locally, which keeps the economy local as well. That's what keeps you know, our local economy going. And we at the city council have uh, done a number of things to uh, provide uh, certain uh, services uh, and also extend loans to small business owners. Uh, but we really need the federal government to step in here uh, because we are dealing with a uh, $10 billion budget gap that saw a lot of cuts. Uh, as you see, uh, we are slowly opening back up the city and the economy, but it's not going to go fast enough. And a lot of our small business owners, if they don't get relief from uh, rent relief uh, and other uh, loans that can keep them afloat, they're not going to open up their doors again. And we're going to lose that. And we're going to lose the uh, uh, really the essential uh, workers. And what has really made uh, our community so great is that the small business owners were the ones that kept us going throughout this pandemic. So we have to do a lot more, but we need our federal uh, government to step up and come in with uh, some real relief. Thank you, uh, Francisco. Yatsiri, I'm going to uh, just ask because you guys provide so much help to vulnerable members of uh, Jackson Heights, uh, East Elmhurst, Corona. I wonder what, what should people who are struggling to pay their bills right now, uh, wh what should they do? Uh, and what, you know, what role does Make the Road uh, play in all of this? Well, we're, right now where we're pushing for and at the state level um, are two main things. Uh, we know that um, as uh, Francisco mentioned, many of our immigrant and Latinx communities are being excluded at the federal government, um, especially uh, from any type of economic relief. Um, so we're calling for the state to pass um, this um, worker, excluded workers um, fund that will provide um, Economic relief um, to workers that have been excluded um, from um, from federal relief, and also we're still um, in la lucha um, trying to fight for the cancellation of rent. We know that many of our members back in um, April they were struggling to pay rent, and we're months into the pandemic, and many are still fearing that um, soon they will be displaced and possibly even lose their homes. Um, so that's what we're doing um, in the terms of policies, um, but. Um, even though our offices are closed, people can still reach at us um, either by calling us or going to our website where we have more information and how um, people can remain connected and learn um, about what we're doing and how to get help. Okay. Uh, Dr. Asu, I'm going to move on to you and we kind of have to wrap everything up here, but um, I wonder if you can just uh, leave us with some advice moving forward given how hard hit uh, our communities have been, uh, the Latino community, and especially given that health experts are now concerned that during the fall, we may have not just the coronavirus pandemic to worry about, but also the regular influenza season. That's right. And that the, the combination of the two viral illnesses, for me personally, I find worrisome, to be honest. We didn't see that in this last um, hopefully the last, but the last several months of this pandemic, we haven't seen those two viruses together in, in, 
in Mass Effect. So that could be coming this fall. And I think we need to all be very mindful of that. So continue the, the social distancing, continue the hygiene, washing the hands, sanitizing and, and protecting those who are around you, protecting yourself. So to the protecting yourself concept, go to your doctors. So if you have a health condition that hasn't been treated in, in a period of time because of the pandemic, please make sure you're getting in for that routine maintenance. And if there's a concern, doctors are available for immediate consultations when needed. We're doing telehealth, we're seeing patients in person. Most of the systems are, are up to speed with in-person visits now in a way that can keep you very safe. So at least I can tell you at our hospital system, we as, as essential workers to the healthcare system have to take precautions to make sure that we are keeping our patients safe. So rest assured the hospitals and the offices are safe for you. So if you have a concern, please come in because we have significant disparities in black and Latino communities. Those gaps will not be narrowed if we're not treating our underlying health conditions. And so to help you stay as safe as you can, we need to make sure that your routine concerns are being addressed. Okay. Thank you guys so much. I think this discussion was so important. Uh, it was really important to have. I really appreciated uh, Francisco, uh, Yatsiri, and Dr. Azu. Thank you to all three of you for being able to touch on this very important topic uh, today. Really appreciate it. Uh, again, I'm Cristian Benavides. Really appreciate everyone who was watching, who was joining us on our first edition back for Cafecito. Again, Cafecito from home, not in the studio. <laughs> Uh, so we'll see you guys again next week for another edition of Cafecito. Have a good rest of your day.